ಕುಲಕರ್ಣಿ ಸರ್ ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಮಾಡು ಹಲೋ ವಿನೋದ್ ಏ ವಿನೋದ್ ಯಾರು ಆಡಿಯೋ ಆನ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ನೋಡು ಯಾರು ಅಂತ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಕುಲ್ಕಡಿ ಸರ್ ಇರ್ಬೇಕು ನೋಡು ಕುಲ್ಕಡಿ ಸರ್ ಎಲ್ಲಿದೆ ಸರ್ ಹೆಸರೇ ಕಾಣಿಸ್ತಲ್ಲ ಓಕೆ ಒನ್ ಮಿನಿಟ್ ವಿನ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಸೆಷನ್ देयर ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅವ್ ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ನೌ ಓಕೆ ಯಾರು ಆಡಿ ಆಗಿದೆ ನೋಡಪ್ಪ ಮೀಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಪ್ರಶಾಂತ್ ಸರ್ ಪ್ರಶಾಂತ್ ಸರ್ ಬಿನ್ನಿ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ more than 400 registration for this webinar that shows the importance of the title of the uh, this uh, webinar that is industry 4.0 industry 4.0 refers to the intelligent networking of machines and processes for industry with the help of information and communication technology it is a combination of uh, core engineering branches as well as the it this one week webinar on industry 4.0 is organized to create awareness among the industry members about the changing trends in industry and fill the gap between industry institutes and industry the topics of the webinar are additive manufacturing and 3d printing industrial design electric vehicles advances in cnc machines and industrial robots all the resources from industry to give an exposure of what is thing happening in the industry i heartily welcome chief guest dr vishwas who is working as business head with mc solutions private limited bangalore he is an engineering professional with a doctorate in automation and adaptive control system from university of new south wales australia he is an active researcher in the field of additive manufacturing i welcome you sir for this inaugural function i heartily welcome guest of honor dr g kopala krishna sir director nagar educational society who supports all the activities of the department as well as the college He has received the Best Principal Award from VTU and Abdul Abdul Kalam Award from Crest Society. And I want to extend a warm welcome to you, sir. I will Thank you, Dr. Sikhi Namurthy. Thank you, sir. I welcome Dr. Sikhi Namurthy, Principal NCT for inaugural function. He is one of the motivators of organizing the webinar. I welcome you to this uh, inaugural function. I will... Thank you very much. I welcome Dr. Arisha, Vice Principal, Dr. Jitendra and Dr. Kumar, who are the deans of our college and coordinators of this webinar, and my colleagues, as well as our uh, participants of today's program for the inaugural function. I am sure that you will be enjoying this one-week webinar. Thank you, Ananda. Now, I request uh, Dr. Vishwas to address the gathering. Sir, you can unmute yourself and you can address the gathering. Sure, sir. Thank you. So, do we, uh, do I start with the presentation itself, sir? Can I uh, no, sir, no, go sir. ahead with that? You can speak. No, sir. You can speak two minutes. Okay. The session, you can... Uh... Right. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, good morning, all of you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity, uh, Dr. Kapilan. Uh, it's always uh, a privilege to go back to... Uh, 
engineering institutions and uh, uh, share our little bit of learnings and experience that we have gained in the uh, in the industrial environment. Uh, in fact, that's the best way uh, that we can contribute back to where we come from. Uh, I feel uh, this is uh, uh, gaining momentum in the past uh, three or four years, which was lacking a lot in the past, uh, where industry and academia should uh, coexist, where uh, there's a good interdependence between the two, where uh, industry can rely on academia for a lot of uh, uh, core research areas and uh, share back the experiences from a practical perspective uh, back to the uh, academia. So there's a, a good a congenial environment and students get a practical learning, not just uh, what they get to learn from textbooks and classrooms. So I think this is a great initiative, uh, a week-long uh, uh, webinar series on Industry 4.0. Uh, this is probably one of the most sought-after topics today. Uh, especially because uh, uh, the whole world is moving towards this stream. And it's not one subject. It's actually uh, a good combination of multiple subjects and technologies which are there, uh, which Industry 4.0 covers. It, it ranges all the way from automotive industry to uh, uh, electronics, computer science, a lot of uh, software uh, in terms of data analytics that have uh, come in. And uh, then uh, we also have... Uh, uh, a lot of mechanical aspects that go into this where you have smart machines which are coming in. So this covers pretty much the entire gamut of uh, 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 manufacturing and uh, uh, technology. So that way, uh, a lot of people may be able to add value onto this. And one of the topics that we are referring to or touching on today, which is additive manufacturing, fits in very well, uh, very smartly into the whole uh, uh, big umbrella of uh, Industry 4.0. So uh, I believe uh, it's a very exciting uh, subject for us too. We have been working on it for a few for the past few years, uh, and uh, uh, we believe there's a lot of opportunity going ahead in India, considering the vast volume of uh, people uh, that we have and uh, consumer uh, consumers that we have. So um, uh, without any further ado, I'd probably want to uh, get started with the whole process. And thank you so much for this opportunity again, sir. I wish uh, the whole program uh, grand success going ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for the informative speech. Now I request uh, Dr. Ajay Kopalakrishna, Director of Nagar Education Society, to address the gathering. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Vishwas. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, I would like to know, are you working with Sri Ramdas, Ace Manufacturing? Center? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I have uh, the great fortune of being a part of uh, the same company, sir, or the same group, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Convey my regards to him. We are together in uh, many of the committees, uh, okay. uh, especially the, yeah, so they might, uh, Sri Madhva Vadiraja Institute of Technology there. Okay, I'm also great. A morning call member. He's also there. We share a right. uh, few things uh, when we meet. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, he is a gentleman to the core. I I know him personally, and okay, uh, great. We have, we have met him in Udupi as well as uh, in Bangalore also. I had come to your uh, industry sometime, maybe about uh, one and a half years back or so, when the okay. governing council meeting was held. Or it was hosted by Sri Ramdas. It was held okay. in your uh, organization. Yes, yes, I remember that, sir. I remember that. Very, very nice setup, and uh, the it's a very employee-friendly environment. That's what I have understood uh, from the yes, organization visit, from the industry visit, including uh, yes, the sir, lunch yes. spread. Yeah. Oh, great, so, great. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're very glad, sir. Yeah, very, very nice. Yeah. You are basically from Putge. Yes, are you, sir. Are you from? Yes, sir. I yeah, am. Very sir. nice. Okay, okay. Very nice, and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining and uh, hosting this as a resource thank person. You, sir. Fantastic. Your input uh, is Great. required uh, by all the participants of this uh, webinar. And uh, especially during sure. the long time, the webinar yeah. uh, will be yeah. much helpful to the participants. Uh, one is True. it can be the, either the student participants or the faculty participants in in all the ways webinar is going to help them now during this time they can utilize the time very efficiently and usefully that's what i feel True, True, True. now 
Now, coming to the uh, point, Industry 4.0, as you have said, the world is moving towards Industry 4.0. I do understand that. But in India, yes, uh, during this time, uh, uh, I feel there is a lot of shift that is going to take place. And right, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, some disturbance. Hello? Is it okay? Yeah. Hello. Hello? Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, uh, especially during this time, there is a yeah. shift towards the, I think, uh, electric vehicles, what we were thinking about 10, 15 years back. And uh, yeah, it has come to reality now. It is uh, already two-wheelers are in full swing and the four-wheelers also yeah. have come to the market. That stage has come, though there is a little bit uh, increase in the cost. Uh, there, it is going to come on in the days to come so that uh, when the mass manufacturing happens and more and more innovation happens, particularly in the uh, batteries, the lithium ion battery yeah. which has come to the market, this, uh, yeah. if some more innovation takes place, when uh, the energy crisis was there, the solar energy came to picture. Yeah. At that point of time, also, we were thinking all these uh, solar panels, if it can be cost effective and if it is uh, uh, affordable, then more and more people, even in the rural areas, they can go for the solar energy. But that has become a reality now. Similarly, the electric right. vehicles also feel will be a reality in the mass section. And more and more people will start using this. So therefore, uh, as uh, the engineers, if we know the core branch of engineering, be it uh, the electronics, be it the mechanical engineering, or be it uh, the uh, civil engineering, if we are into only the core branch of engineering and have the knowledge of the core fundamentals, that is not just enough. That is the foundation only. And based on that, I think uh, we should build up and uh, apply that in terms of the technology. So therefore, uh, all of our uh, staff and students should uh, add on some more skills to their basic qualification, whatever they have. They should get more skill sets into their learning environment. And thereby, they should have certification. They should learn more things particularly with the technology being applied and advanced in the industry. See, if uh, our students can visit uh, Yes Manufacturing Systems, for example, I'm giving, they will learn many things which they have learned from the book. The practical application of that in the field, that way, I think it is going to help them. So therefore, more and more such things have to come. I mean, be it the application of the IoT, be it the application of the, including the data science that we are mentioning, the machine learning and the data science, uh, which has come to light, maybe in the last 10 years, 15 years, it has come out. But, but in India, it has uh, caught uh, the important uh, front stage only in the recent years. AI and ML have caught uh, importance maybe during the last uh, three, four years or so. So therefore, yeah. I feel I uh, the <laughs> topics that are in our, yeah. the IoT applications of IoT, robotics, the particularly the 3D printing, the application of 3D printing is coming in a very big way. That's what we have seen. Uh, every faculty and student should be exposed to these things. Indus the, yes, then the industry 4.0 carries a meaning in the minds of the youngsters if if yes. they know these things, definitely they can build up and bring in more and more technology to be used in the industry that way a true combination of uh, industry and academia will take place 
i feel more such uh, webinar to be done and uh, uh, again uh, dr vishwas uh, for having spared your valium in educating our uh, faculty and students with the latest technology that is applied in the industry and i should congratulate uh, dr kapilan and his entire team for uh, successfully launching this and conducting such very useful and eventful uh, exercise like uh, industry 4.0 webinar i congratulate uh, dr kapilan and his entire team i wish the event uh, to be a successful one it's a uh, one week uh, program and the output of this 4.0 should uh, come out as a compendium so that uh, that can be shared in the copy forum among all the participants for further reference thank you very much for giving me please convey my regards to shri ramas and his entire sure, uh, in, and his family also sure sir i'll thank do that you. sir thank, thank you, you so much thank you sir for informative speech and uh, encouraging us to organize this type of program now i request uh, dr vikanamurthy uh, k principal ncet to address the gathering thank you everybody am i audible yes sir yes sir yeah uh, esteemed uh, guest and resource person of the today's uh, webinar and dr vishwas and uh, respected director dr gopal krishna and other dignitaries students and faculty members at the outset uh, uh, i would like to say that um, we are very happy that Kap dr kapilan and team they are very active in this lockdown period and conducting various workshops and uh, webinars which are very much useful to the students as well as faculty members as our director and vishwas telling now today we are uh, entering to all uh, smartness smart people smart city smart machines and so on and the whole paradigm has been shifted to the uh, latest technologies like artificial intelligence machine learning imported into various uh, disciplines uh, in not only computer science or electronics including mechanical and even civil engineering as well and data science is getting very very important uh, aspect nowadays and it is a uh, high time for the uh, faculty and students because faculty also update with their uh, knowledge and uh, students has to develop the skills today only skill oriented jobs are more required and all the industry or whatever that is uh, they are expecting skills so it is the right time for for everyone to update their skills in this regard uh, the webinar on industry 4.0 is very much uh, right and uh, useful and uh, congratulations to kapilan once again for uh, having arranging this for the benefit of the fraternity teaching fraternity as well as students and i hope uh, uh, the students and faculty members will get maximum benefit of uh, this one week uh, webinar and uh, uh, i hope uh, the program will be successful i wish uh, everyone uh, all the best and i thank for giving me an opportunity to speak in this uh, occasion thank you uh, everyone thank you sir now i request uh, mr balaji to propose vote of thanks good morning one and all sir am i audible sir yes yes and in yeah good morning one and all honorable chief guest of the day dr vishwas r puttigi respected guest of honor uh, dr sg gopalakrishna sir respected principal dr shrikant murthy sir respected hod dr n kapilan and dear participants i consider it a privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries on behalf of uh, mechanical engineering department Nagarjuna College of Engineering and Technology. I take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Vishwas R. Puttagi for accepting our invitation to be Chief Guest and Resource Person for today's program by taking out a valuable time for his busy schedule. Thank you, sir, for your insightful address. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. I express my sincere thanks to our director, Dr. S. G. Gopalakrishna, for his uh, constant support and motivation in all our activities. And I thank for your uh, thought-provoking uh, address, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Balaji. I extend my sincere thanks to our uh, principal, Dr. Srikant Murthy K, for uh, providing encouragement and support in organizing this program. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Balaji. I thank HOD for uh, organizing this webinar uh, in this uh, need of hour, where uh, he has taken a lot of efforts in uh, making this program uh, uh, making this program uh, executable. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Balaji. I thank all the student and the staff coordinators for their support and cooperation in making this program a successful one. Finally, but not least, I thank all the participants for uh, turning up turning up in large numbers to enrich their knowledge in latest technologies. Thank you, thank you, one and all. Over to you, sir. Kapilan. Yes, sir. Ha. Kapilan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many viewers are there on the YouTube uh, now? Uh, check it, sir. Actually, totally around 400 uh, participants have registered. You have given two Very YouTube links. This is uh, across the country or across South India. How is it? Across the country, sir. Actually, we have participants from other states also. Other states also. Okay, very yes, good. Sir, Magarata, uh -huh. Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka. Very good. Okay. Finally, you make a compendium. You just in the form of at least a soft copy also. The the output of this webinar should be consolidated and then you send it across to all uh, the participants. It will help them as a guide. Okay, sir. Okay, right. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, over to, I think, uh, yeah, Vishwas. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you can start your presentation, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, thank you again. I'd like to start with uh, by thanking uh, uh, the organizing committee here for giving me this opportunity. As you all know, a lot of people have known about additive manufacturing, but uh, I'd uh, still like to run through uh, uh, the whole process uh, and also state some of the applications, advantages of additive manufacturing, and then wind up with some uh, good case studies and examples of how it's being used today in the industry. Uh, next. So, um, so basically, additive manufacturing is only a terminology which is gaining uh, uh, a lot of prominence now. It has been in existence for the past uh, 40 odd years. Uh, it has been known by different names uh, in the past. Uh, and only now it's gaining a lot of uh, importance and momentum because industry is accepting it well uh, and using it for uh, various uh, applications. So uh, just a quick intro about Amaze Solutions. So we are basically a service bureau, which means we provide end-to-end -end 3D printing solutions. Uh, we are a part of Ace Micromatic Group. We are basically a joint venture between Ace Designers, which is uh, the largest CNC turning manufacturing company, and uh, Ace Manufacturing Systems, which is the machining center company. Uh, Sir did mention about that. Uh, and uh, basically, we are the uh, additive manufacturing wing of uh, Ace Micromatic Group. We are fairly young, but uh, we've been offering services uh, to different industries today. You'll have a look at some of the examples. Next. So basically, uh, we have seen uh, different types of traditional manufacturing. Just a quick intro on that. We know mostly parts that we use, we feel we you uh, we uh, we see around us are all either casted through a casting process or formed using a press. Uh, as you can see there, joined using a welding process, as you've seen, and finally taken up for uh, a machining. Uh, so this is normally how traditionally uh, uh, any metallic object is uh, done, broadly classified into. Uh, uh, but uh, going ahead, uh, uh, in the machining, we have aspects such as turning, uh, milling, drilling, tapping. These are all different processes in subtractive manufacturing. So the, in the conventional manufacturing process, we call this as subtractive manufacturing. I'm sure a lot of us uh, from the mechanical engineering stream would have uh, studied this, used these machines, 
uh, and actually felt uh, the process. So uh, bulk of the manufacturing today, be it any automotive part, which uh, is especially important in our transmission and uh, 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 movement, are all uh, subjected to these subtractive manufacturing processes where you have material being removed. So why is it called subtractive? Because material is removed from uh, an existing state. It could be from a casted part or a forged part or even a solid uh, block that is machined. So finally, you remove material to get your final part. So that's why it's called a subtractive manufacturing. On the contrary, additive manufacturing is basically a process where you put material together. So what you see here is a small comparison where uh, in a subtractive, you start from a solid block and remove a whole lot of material. And then you finally get your uh, final part. Whereas in additive, you have you start from a, uh, uh, from a material which is fused either through a heat source or laser or electron beam or a binder. We'll see some of those processes where uh, you basically put the material together just enough to get your final part with very minimum wastage. So that way, this is a very uh, green process. So uh, it's a very uh, uh, natural way of doing things. So uh, next. So uh, this is an interesting curve, which again substantiates the uh, comparison between additive and subtractive. Focus on the uh, x and y axis here. On the x axis, we have complexity. And on the y axis, we have cost. So uh, the green line here, what we have is basically how we would go about costing uh, a part which has to be made conventionally. So conventionally, any part, when the complexity goes up, your cost shoots up drastically. So as uh, if, if your part needs uh, a fourth axis to be uh, used to machine a part or a four axis machine or a five axis machine, then the cost shoots up dramatically. So uh, because of this, what happens, most of the designers end up simplifying their design of their parts so that complexity reduces. They break the large complex part that is required finally into smaller pieces, which could probably be machined or manufactured using simpler processes. So this is how conventionally parts are being done. Whereas with 3D printing, your complexity is pretty much free, which means irrespective of how complex a part is, the cost remains the same. Uh, the only aspect that actually builds, uh, that decides the cost is the material, the amount of uh, material that goes in, and also the volume of the part. I mean, how, uh, uh, the, uh, how is the volume uh, of the part being printed? So irrespective of that, the cost remains the same. So which means you could have a very complex part weighing uh, X grams that is being printed, or a simple solid block of X grams being printed, the cost would remain the same. So that way, you are better off choosing the part which is more complex when you decide to use the additive manufacturing process. So what we have is that small red line that you can see there, which is dropping straight down to the X axis, which is basically the tipping off point, which says any part which is uh, uh, complex beyond a specific point then it doesn't make sense to use the conventional route. You're better off 3D printing it. So that's basically uh, what is being shown here. Uh, uh, so anything beyond that red line, which is called the break-even point, uh, uh, irrespective of the complexity, the cost will remain the same. But something simpler, very uh, uh, straightforward that can be done the conventional way, it doesn't make sense from an economical point of view to go for 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So this is basically the whole gist of this uh, slide here. Uh, so what you see next is basically uh, 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 advantages of additive manufacturing. So what we have seen, most of the uh, current manufacturing route is all subtractive in nature. So you've seen uh, whatever we've mentioned earlier, uh, most of the automotive, aerospace, uh, medical, you take any aspect of manufacturing, they use subtractive uh, routes. But the natural way of doing any object or creating any object is additive way, be it a tree or bird, an animal, the human body, all of them are being made actually the additive way. We don't get uh, an arm or a leg which is screwed into us or joined uh, as a separate member and then put together. Uh, we are actually formed the additive way where we are formed as a monolith structure and then we grow internally. Uh, another advantage is simplified product design. So what 3D printing does is it allows you to uh, uh, make uh, uh, take up product, make it make product design very simple. So what uh, uh, when you conventionally design any part for a specific application, you always have a constraint from a, a manufacturing side, either from a casting guy or a forging person who's going to be telling, look, this cannot be done. Or you'd have constraints from a machining person who'd end up telling, look, I cannot insert a tool to do a hole or a mill it at a specific angle. So you'll have to break it into multiple pieces or even assembly for all you know, because you cannot assemble it together in its current complex state. So uh, whereas with 3D printing, you can print assemblies, which means you do not, you're not worried about 
how the input processes you can directly print assemblies we'll be looking at some of those examples uh, uh, going ahead so that's a, a big advantage um, so uh, interestingly uh, if you've seen uh, metal tools we we discussed about co conventional components which are being 3d printed like uh, the ones on the top left uh, but what is also happening is the medical field. Uh, one of the most prominent areas is uh, dental copings. If you actually see one of the latest uh, uh, technologies being used by dentists is to print dental copings, which is what a cap that uh, you'd want to be inserted onto your tooth, which is probably spoiled, uh, is uh, for done through maybe a 3D scanning of your uh, uh, tooth, and then that is converted into a 3D model, and then a dental coping is printed. So here, irrespective of uh, the... Uh, uh, volume, what the 3D printing manufacturer does is uh, he would get input from different dentists and they're all printed together on a single uh, block or a single plate. So uh, you're basically doing something called as mass customization. When we say mass customization, you're producing something in high volumes, but they're all customized parts. They're not necessarily high volumes of identical parts. We all know mass production. Uh, now mass customization has become, I'm sorry, mass production has become mass customization wherein you're pr uh, printing, 3D printing for every specific patient individually, but in high volume. So volumes would remain, but uh, they're all going to be customized. Similarly, you have uh, uh, prosthetics, you have uh, orthopedic implants, various medical uh, implants that are happening. Then of course, uh, uh, what used to happen conventionally in 3D printing was rapid prototyping, where you'd want to get something done in a small uh, uh, plastic uh, to uh, mainly for visualization purpose. That is happening that you've seen, known, most of us know about that. Uh, it, interestingly, a lot of homes are being printed today. You have concrete printing machines, which can print bridges and homes in very uh, difficult environment. And in fact, even for speed today, we've known uh, uh, of uh, 3D printed buildings, which are uh, uh, done in less than a month's time, multi-floried buildings, which are printed in less than a month's time, which is uh, all because of 3D printing. Uh, food printers, we have interestingly today food printers, uh, which can print cakes and pastries and biscuits and cookies and chocolates all in different shapes of either characters or uh, uh, different persons, humans also. Uh, there are apparently food printers sitting in uh, a space station where uh, astronauts who go up there need hot, fresh food. They can press a button and food gets printed there. So like this, interesting applications. Uh, jewelry is another interesting field because you can print them really light. Light weighting is one of the key applications of 3D printing. So a lot of uh, interesting people have started printing gold and other exotic material where uh, make it look big and bulky, but it's actually hollow or lightweight from inside. And they can also be uh, with a very intricate design. So this way, different applications. Now, uh, going ahead, some of the key, one of the biggest uh, uh, subjects in additive manufacturing is DFAM. We call it as, uh, it's actually design for additive manufacturing. We've all learned about design for manufacturing, but this is design for additive manufacturing, wherein uh, the subject deals with a lot of optimization, be it weight optimization, topology optimization. It basically means uh, uh, taking a part which needs uh, to be uh, which you'd want to be printing it, uh, where we do a lot of design change, modify it to make sure you uh, reduce the weight, reduce uh, uh, the unwanted uh, redundant aspects of the part and make it just enough and make it suitable for 3D printing. We'll have a look at some of the examples going ahead, but other advantages is part consolidation. I explained that today people are 3D printing consolidated parts, which means you could have multiple pieces of uh, individual parts which are all put together as a single assembly and then printed together. Now, this also helps you in direct part replacement, which means where you'd have spare parts and aspects like that, you can reproduce them very quickly and then replace them, which is a big application today. And of course, we've always known rapid prototyping where uh, high volumes of uh, part where you'd have a lot of uh, rap prototyping to be done before any development of a uh, maybe an automobile or an aircraft all of that can be uh, prototyped using 3D printing, which is a key adv advantage today. Uh, going ahead, um, normally we uh, classify uh, additive manufacturing uh, or suitability for additive manufacturing based on quantity. Now, take an example now, say, for example, you have a part which is very low volume, say less than 250. 250 is just a uh, figure there, but you could have it as any number based on application. So if it's a, a low volume and if the geometry is machinable, uh, then normally people go for a CNC route. But if the geometry is not machinable, then we suggest just printing those parts because your volumes are too low to be even die casting it or injection molding it based on what part you're making. Now, whereas if your parts are high in numbers where you want high volumes of parts to be manufactured 
and if your geometry is machinable then you'd go for an investment casting or a die casting traditional route that you'd follow but if your geometry is not machinable then we'd suggest uh, printing those patterns uh, through uh, investment your, your investment casting patterns can be printed uh, using 3d printing route uh, where you could print aluminum or any other material and use them as patterns so you don't have to actually go ahead and machine it and use it directly for making your uh, casting so that's basically how we classify from a volume perspective going ahead uh, these are different technologies we uh, touched upon that so today uh, uh, we have people printing polymers we have people printing sand metal ceramics wax kevlar graphite people are printing all sorts of exotic materials today uh, for industrial applications uh, is suiting different requirements. So basically, uh, some of the broader classifications are uh, listed below, say, for example, based on durability, based on surface finish, uh, based on detailing that is required for the part, uh, then application. Say, for example, you have, uh, so the technologies basically show that. So if you move from a lower durability to a higher durability, uh, a smoother surface finish to a rougher surface finish. So these are all different names that are given on the right. You can see stereolithography, polymer jetting, binder jetting, fuse deposition, uh, uh, laser melting. La uh, basically, some of them are for polymer materials, some of them are for uh, metal, some are for ceramics, some are for uh, a combination today. So these are different technologies, and uh, uh, they have been evolving over the past uh, 20, 30 years, and some of them are fairly new, very new. In fact, binder jetting and all are very new, latest uh, ones, and uh, uh, cost-effectively, you can print metal parts using the binder jetting technology. Uh, these are comp compact small machines which are being uh, 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 popularized. So going ahead, you can see uh, uh, the whole process uh, of process flow of additive manufacturing. What you see on the left side is it all starts with a 3D model. How does this work? So you have a 3D model. Anything that, that has a 3D model that can be converted into a 3D model can be 3D printed. So from a 3D model, we go ahead, convert it into a triangulation file. So basically, STL file is basically a triangulation file. Uh, any part is broken down into triangles uh, from a surface perspective. And then this file is sliced. So you slice it into multiple layers. And each layer information is passed on to the machine. And each layer is laid one on top of the other to get your final part. So that's basically how the whole process works. Uh, now you can see that uh, happening there. One on the, in the fourth step, you have the whole printing process going on. Once the process is done, then you have some finishing process which is done, which is we call it as a post-processing. In this case, we have uh, the end part uh, based on some uh, application either through heat treatment or machining or uh, other surface finish, uh, uh, surface treatment processes that we follow to finish the part and give it the final shape and uh, uh, form that we want. So uh, we'll specify, I mean, so uh, interestingly, another aspect which uh, is changing in the market is product life cycle. If you've seen, what used to take from a product development uh, life, uh, uh, which used to be about five, six, seven years, are all shrinking into one or two years now. So uh, take an example of an automobile. What a car like a Swift took in, a, in its first generation to be modified, say uh, it took about seven or eight years before it underwent a change or a modification. Uh, now it's all happening in about three or four years. The second version of 3D printing came down to about three or four years, and the next version will go down even further, maybe in about two years. So people are getting restless. So every product is getting obsolete very quickly, be it mobile phones, your televisions, because the technology is evolving so fast. Now, one of the technologies which is really supporting it well is 3D printing, because what would otherwise take you many weeks or months to make your first casting part can be printed in a few hours' time. We have we have printed parts for automobile manufacturers where uh, otherwise they would have had to cast it in, in about uh, uh, three months' time or two months' time are all 3D printed in about uh, two or three weeks' time and offered it to them for testing. Right now, as we speak, also a lot of the uh, uh, parts which are undergoing change uh, are uh, going through this process. In fact, a lot of BS4 to BS6 conversion happened through uh, 3D printing route for those initial batches when they wanted to test it and uh, see the functioning. So uh, that way, AM is the most suitable process uh, for this uh, supporting this technology. Going ahead, so uh, uh, as I explained, different materials you can see on the top left, you have sand printers. These are polymer printers, multi-jet, multi-color printers. You have uh, uh, beautiful multi-colored uh, over uh, 30, 40 colors of printing available today by different manufacturers. Ceramics are being 3D printed. You can see that complex structure, which is almost impossible to manufacture. 
uh, graphite is being 3D printed, metal we've seen, we'll see more. Uh, diamond, Sandvik is a company who's been successful in printing diamond. Diamond has not only an ornamental uh, advantage, but also is known for being the strongest material in the uh, material that is actually found and that is used mostly for cutting applications. So uh, for that uh, purpose, uh, uh, it has been 3D printed so that it can be uh, used and made in large volumes and used for its application. So that way, different materials. We'll focus our presentation going ahead a little on uh, metals. So you'll see a little more uh, cases of metals going ahead. Uh, next. Um, so you can see this here. Uh, this is a technology called as laser powder bed fusion. If you actually see most of the metals that are being 3D printed today are uh, uh, using this technology called as powder bed fusion technology. So what happens here is material uh, in the form of metal in the form of powder is laid on a plate, as you can see here on the top uh, uh, image that is being pointed. So uh, it's being uh, laid like this, as you see, and then you have laser which comes and melts that powder and it fuses to the previous layer. So previously melted part is fused to the new layer of powder. So as in every layer is completed, the platform goes down on which this is printed uh, and the next layer of powder is laid. So you can see on the left side, the blue image actually shows you multiple of these layers of the powder which was fused uh, uh, into forming the part uh, which is sitting in the middle of a big cake of powder. So now this layer of powder could be anywhere between 30 to 100 microns thick uh, to get your part which is finally almost finished. So this is basically how it happens. So the power source could be either laser or electron beam. What you see on top is basically a, a laser beam which is deflected by a mirror. It's a two-axis mirror which actually melts, uh, which uh, deflects the, uh, uh, the laser beam very, very uh, selectively, accurately at a specific spot and then melts the powder and fuses it to the previous layer. This is very similar to a micro welding process. So any material that can be welded can be 3D printed. So imagine you have a lot, you've heard of laser welding. Uh, so this is very similar to that, but happening at a micron level, very, very fine level. So that way you get your accurate part with the very less defects on it. Next. So what we have uh, uh, going ahead is a demonstration of this printing process. So there's a small video which shows you the 3D, uh, 3D printing process. Uh, here you can see there are two lasers. Uh, 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 printing two different parts on the left side uh, where the current layer of powder is being fused to the previously printed layer of powder. Uh, and uh, uh, as the printing process completes, you have the next layer of powder, which is laid. So on the, in the middle, what you see is uh, an image of a part which is already printed. So this part, which is being printed after printing, uh, and we when we lift it up, you'll see uh, the metal part is uh, embedded in the middle of a big cake of powder. So when we extract all the powder out, when we remove all the powder out, what you see is you get on the what you get on the right side. So basically, this is a printed part which is fused to the uh, build plate or the uh, uh, base plate uh, on which the part is fused. And this is basically cut uh, and then taken further for finishing if required. Otherwise, in some applications, it's ready as it is and can be used. So that way, in a very few, a very short time, in few hours, you can actually get the part that you want. Going ahead, next. Uh, so uh, in this whole process, uh, what you've seen uh, at the metal 3D printing process, we discussed about powder bed fusion, PBF. So as I explained, about 75% of the printing that is happening in metal uses the powder bed fusion technology. The other one is DED, which is basically direct energy deposition or a direct uh, metal deposition. Uh, in this case, basically what you have is uh, a metal being fused through a coaxial laser and uh, uh, metal jet, a, a powder uh, metal is actually sprayed uh, using a nozzle onto uh, a, a plate. Basically, this is similar to a five axis machining. If you've all seen five axis machining, uh, you can uh, imagine instead of the spindle, which is cutting material, you have a nozzle uh, body, which is spraying metal and laser surrounding it. So basically, laser melts the powder wherever it's being sprayed on. So that way, you can print parts of any shape and size uh, as required uh, in this whole uh, technology. Uh, and the third one is the new one, which is called binder jetting, which I explained uh, some time back. It's also an interesting field where you have basically a binder, which is more like a glue, which is sprayed on uh, selectively in areas where uh, you'd want uh, the bonding to happen. And then the next layer of powder is laid. And again, uh, the uh, binder, which is the glue, is sprayed. So this way, you uh, at the end of the whole process, you get a big cake of uh, part, which is in its green stage, which is just glued together. And that will have to be subjected to a sintering process, 
basically it will be put into an oven which will melt the whole part uh, and uh, fuse them together and then finally a debinding process where uh, it removes the binder and then you have your final part ready so this is uh, one of the newer technology which has come in in the past 5 uh, uh, 5 6 years time but it's uh, at a very nascent stage so this actually uh, uh, shows you this slide shows you about surface finish so what you see on the left side is a very coarse thickness imagine uh, we take it as a 80 micron uh, layer thickness so when you want a part which is uh, 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 which has to be printed fast we end up choosing uh, a coarse thickness so this has a, a, an advantage of printing faster uh, it uh, you get your fi pa final part uh, much sooner uh, but uh, it's an economical approach but the problem is the surface finish is very poor you don't get a very uh, finished part so you'll have to probably subject it to some post processing or finishing machining uh, here on the right side what you see rightmost side you see a thin layer thickness say for example 30 micron layer thickness uh, here the printing is slow but it's almost ready to use in its final shape uh it may be a little more expensive to use uh but uh because you you you'll be taking longer time to print uh because time is what decides the cost uh, uh but you also have an option of printing it in hybrid what you see in the middle here where you have coarser areas which doesn't need too much of uh, finesse you could probably go ahead and print it in larger thickness and then maybe when you have uh, finer aspects you can print it in lower thickness eventually you'd want a surface finish as shown in the image at the back so where you'd want a smoother surface finish which is achievable through post processing which is finishing it through some uh, post processing process so it's all about finding the right balance so we explained about design for additive manufacturing so we'll quickly uh, run through this so basically this is a science where uh, uh, as designers we can sit and understand apply a lot of uh, am techniques to find out how do we make a uh, part more suitable for its uh, application so uh, here uh, say like we've told you can create intricate shapes uh, and uh, produce them with lighter material or make it uh, lighter uh, so if actually if people for people who have used ansys uh, which is uh, what you'd use to simulate uh, uh, weight optimization and uh, ask based on certain conditions ask uh, ansys to throw out the most optimum structure it normally throws out a structure which is uh, in a in a maybe a bionic state a bionic form which is very weird in shape and size uh, so what we end up doing it uh, doing is to add a lot of material to make it suitable for manufacturing if you've actually seen uh, though it gives out a very weird shape and structure we end up adding a lot of redundant material hence over designing to make it manufacturable whereas with 3d printing we have an advantage where we can you can see the images in between you have a lot of analysis being done on the uh, extreme end you have a solid block of uh, a bracket which is designed which goes through multiple rounds of uh, uh, iterations of analysis and simulation uh, which finally tells look you need material only in these areas for the kind of strength and uh, load that you have actually asked so that ends up uh, deciding how the shape and size should be and that can be directly taken on to a 3d printer and printed and used for its final application that way you have saved uh, not only material but also a whole lot of time in uh, manufacturing it the conventional way so this way uh, a lot of uh, advantages are there and uh, application i mean design for additive manufacturing is a very important subject fantastic softwares are being made available almost all software manufacturers today are uh, uh, gearing up for uh, this science where they are taking you from a seamless uh, integration design um, uh, simulation analysis manufacturing all these are being done on a single platform which earlier used to be done on different tools going ahead you'll see some more examples of dfam you can see this part here this was basically uh, a, a bracket for airbus an existing part used to be big and bulky like this still an aerospace part which is quite uh, light conventionally compared uh, when you did a topology optimization uh, you ended up getting a part which is uh, seen on the right side so this is actually a part which is being which has been put to test and been used so uh, uh, where you apply topology optimization one of the biggest areas where of am where applications being used is uh, uh, aerospace uh, you can see some of the advantages are uh, very little wastage you have a lot of cost saving when you have exotic material like titanium and others which cost a lot of money if you've seen aerospace parts when you print Uh, about 90 95% of the material is scooped out and finally you get a very lightweight structure so you put a solid block and get a, a very very thin structure which comes out here you can print that directly that's the advantage part consolidation we'll look at that uh, going ahead so you basically can print uh, multiple parts together uh, so here's another interesting example where you have electric vehicle uh, motor housing 
which is uh, uh, 3D printed. So as we, as uh, uh, Sir uh, rightly pointed out, electric vehicles also are hard pressed for weight. Today, if, if you can make a motorcycle or a scooter, which is 3D printed, sorry, which is uh, an electric vehicle, if it has a mileage of say 70 kilometers per uh, uh, full charge of battery, and if you can make it a little lighter, maybe you can push it to 80 kilometers. So that way, it's a huge USP for these automobile manufacturers. So lighter automobiles are the order of the day. So that's where you have a lot of people working towards that. Uh, people like Aether and many others have already started exploring printing uh, parts of polymers and making them lighter. Going ahead, so you'll see uh, um, uh, uh, another interesting aspect of 3D printing is not everything that we... Uh, uh, tell as an advantage of 3D printing is applicable. So there are aspects which we need to follow in terms of uh, making it suitable for printing. So not all parts are ready for 3D printing. So there is something called a supports that get printed along with the part that is actually required. What you see here is that uh, uh, basically the uh, any part which is which has an overhang needs to be supported from the base plate. This is basically similar to a structure that you're building uh, where you have overhanging uh, 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 scaffolds uh, which need to be supported. Otherwise, you'll end up uh, dropping it down or deforming or warping the part. So you see these images here, which shows you that where supports are provided. Uh, the red one and the blue one are basically supports uh, required to support that overhanging structure. Now, this can, give, uh, this can be overcome by doing a small design change, which is also part of the design for additive manufacturing, which you see that uh, by doing a small modification, like uh, which is called a self-supporting structure or self-supporting profile, uh, which actually went uh, where we went about modifying a flat surface on the previous image or, uh, by giving the small angled uh, uh, material that ends up uh, making it self-supporting. Now, this allows parts to be printed without support. So all this is also a part of the design for additive manufacturing. And also you have cooling channels when you have, uh, when you're making uh, molds, which we'll see in a bit, uh, design for them also will be uh, uh, better. When you, when you go for a larger size, you'd have to use a different channel like this, uh, to, uh, which is self-supporting profile when you want to do uh, holes which are larger than a specific size that is uh, dictated by the process. Next. So uh, these, this is what we mentioned in terms of lattice structure. So you can see these here, left side, you have a manifold block, uh, which is actually made of lattice structure. You can see when we say lattice, it's all mesh kind of structure. The external structure remains same, but internally uh, you do a lot of mesh kind of design, which has very le uh, less uh, material. The strength remains the same. Functionally, functionally, it's it's as strong as uh, uh, the solid uh, material, but uh, it's uh, much lighter and uh, hence uh, much better. So on the right side, what you see is an impeller blade, which uh, probably goes into either an aircraft or a, a turbocharged uh, automobile component, which when made lighter like this, uh, can uh, run much faster. So you know some of those turbocharged parts run up to about 30,000, 50,000 RPM. And when it's made lighter, you get so much more better uh, application. You can run it for uh, much higher RPMs going ahead. So that way for making uh, lightweight parts, 3D printing is the right uh, approach. So what you see uh, uh, next is, um, let's wait for it to come up. So yeah, so market segments. So uh, today there are different markets who have adapted uh, 3D printing, medical, aerospace, automobile, tooling, dye industry, and engineering. So we'll look at uh, some of them. Uh, in the medical industry, one of the most popular ones uh, we'll skip this uh, uh, going next. So uh, in the medical industry, one of the most popular, uh, okay, so we look at uh, the, yeah, so uh, uh, so uh, uh, the aspect is uh, medical implants where you have uh, implants, what you see on the left are like your cranioplast implants, which is basically a portion of your skull, uh, maxillofacial implants, your face implants, uh, mandibular implants, which is basically uh, the jawbone. All these are being 3D printed today. Today, when a person meets with an accident uh, uh, on the uh, and uh, the doctor declares bone loss, uh, there are two choices. They can choose a standard generic implant, more like a fixed size of shirt, say 40, 42, 44 size shirt, or it could be a custom. suiting the design of the uh, uh, suiting the design of the particular patient is actually made and uh, 
supplied to the patient in a very short time. So basically a CT scan or an MRI scan file is required as an input and that is used to print this part and supply it to the patient. Similarly, you have hip sockets, uh, dental copings, knee joints, hip uh, joints, uh, SWR cups. All these are being printed today, uh, very specific to a patient's shape and size. Next. Uh, so uh, basically, they say going ahead, a lot of medical implants are going to be uh, done, not only globally, but even in India. Uh, there's a big uh, adaption of 3D printing and the niche uh, areas could be some of these like cranials and uh, hip implants and uh, uh, other uh, uh, orthopedic implants. Next. So we look at uh, uh, aerospace. Now, aerospace, one of the biggest advantages is weight reduction. So uh, you see this bracket on the right side, which originally weighed about two kilo or an excess of two kilo has been brought down to about 766 grams by 3D uh, printing optimization or topology optimization, uh, where the strength remains the same, but the part uh, has been completely optimized. So this way, when parts are done, uh, they pose a huge advantage uh, to aerospace industry. You can see this bracket at the bottom, which is full of lattice. You can see the structure. It's basically, this is the structure called as bionic structure, which originally was a big bulky structure, has been modified to uh, make it very, uh, 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 very specific to the uh, application that is uh, uh, suiting aerospace uh, and also making it lightweight by putting lattice structures, the mesh design that you see, which makes it very suitable. From a strength perspective, it's uh, same, if not higher, but much lighter. This way, uh, lighter aircrafts mean further the distance that they can fly. So that way, today, if you see some of the newer aircrafts that are coming in, are able are able to fly much longer distances. Throw in, throw in. So we have uh, part count reduction. So here you can see on the left side the fuel nozzle. Uh, uh, fuel nozzle basically is what goes into a G uh, engine. And they, uh, the, this, uh, this has been uh, shown, you can see that 20 individual pieces or parts have been integrated into a single piece. So one part is actually a com combination of 20 individual pieces. So this has five times more durability and 25% lighter. So not only is it better uh, from durability point of view, but also lighter. As we speak now, this is not just in product uh, in prototyping, but as this has already gotten into production stage. So you have more than fifty thousand of these nozzles already flying uh, on GE engines. So every GE engine has about four of these nozzles. Uh, so an aircraft which has two or three, uh, two or four uh, you know, engines would have multiple of those uh, fuel nozzles. On the right side, what you see is basically a catalyst engine from GE, which is uh, fairly new, launched about a year and a half ago. Here, 855 individual pieces were integrated into 12 assemblies or 12 pieces and 3D printed. And the advantage is it's 20% 20, 20 uh, lower in fuel burn. It consumes lesser fuel and it's also 5% lesser in weight. Now, the advantage also is you have fewer bill of materials. You have fewer parts. Now, as designers, we all know uh, as and when you have more parts, more the parts, more the reliability issue. You have jo every joint poses uh, uh, your stack up tolerance issue, and this uh, overcomes that by integrating multiple of these parts. That's the advantage uh, which is coming up in, uh, especially in aerospace. Going ahead, cost effectiveness. Uh, so if you actually see, as I explained, manufacturing is cheaper uh, because as opposed to printing something which is a solid block of titanium, which could cost uh, uh, lakhs of rupees and when you remove out your part is uh, nearly one tenth or one, uh, one maybe one twentieth the weight uh, you are better off printing it directly where you have very less crap coming out and uh, your part is uh, very cost effective that way for materials such as exotic materials such as titanium inconel uh, 3d printing seems to be the more suitable route then uh, lastly we have on demand manufacturing this is an interesting area which is coming up not only for aerospace but also for uh, automotive so what is interesting here is uh, we we have a lot of manufacturers such as Daimler and uh, others who have a commitment to their customers telling you, we will they will stock uh, uh, spare parts on account of the customers as long as the vehicle is being put to use. So for example, a, a person can be running a Daimler truck or a Mercedes Benz car. Uh, which is 20 years old, but uh, Mercedes has, come for, uh, has committed telling we will keep the spare parts on your behalf. Now, because of this, they have billions and billions of euros worth of spare parts, which is getting wasted. And that's a lot of money. So instead, what decision they've taken is going ahead in the near future, which they've already started, is they will only keep 3D design, 3D model of the parts. And when there's a requirement, say, for example, in Mysore, 
the local service uh, center will be sent the 3d model and they can get it 3d printed even if it going if it's going to cost 10 times the cost it's okay because you've saved up the cost of keeping inventory of those parts and waiting for nearly a month to get it from some corner of germany into uh, mysore which would take a lot of time and uh, effort and that can be saved by 3d printing locally so this way on demand manufacturing only when there is a demand for a part or a spare part it will be manufactured in very short time that's uh, picking up not only in aerospace but also in automotive so going ahead uh, some uh, uh, so this is an interesting case as we speak this engine of uh, boeing uh, 777x uh, has already been flying with 300 3D printed parts. The engine's name is GE9X. Uh, this is already available. All this is open source information. So more than 300 3D printed metal parts are being used in this engine and it's being uh, uh, flown. So uh, gone are the days when 3D printing can be considered as just a prototyping or a sampling process just for visualization or validation, but it's actually gone into full production. You all know any aerospace part needs uh, a very, very solid airworthiness certification, which means it has to be proved that it can, uh, it's really worthy of flying for many years. So this has been going on for past many, uh, uh, many years. In fact, for the past five to eight years, the validations have been going on. That's why the adaptation is, uh, been low in the past, but now you'll see rampant adaptation of these technologies uh, in uh, industrial areas. So uh, this is going to be the future for aerospace and other aircraft. So you'll see it in the next slide, what the uh, plan is for uh, aerospace industry. So by 2030, we'll be looking at AM designed airframes. So which means not only are we looking at small parts of the aircraft, but the aircrafts will be designed to suit 3D printing process. They will keep only 3D printing or additive manufacturing in mind, to make aircrafts, so this way, maybe aircrafts will have enough fuel, they'll be able to carry enough fuel uh, to fly from maybe Bangalore to uh, Las Vegas or Los, Los Angeles non-stop, which probably today is not possible. So a 20, 25 hours flight should be very straightforward in the next uh, uh, few years time. So that's the beauty of uh, aerospace. Now, uh, in the automotive segment, we've known rapid prototyping that's been there for a long time. It's been uh, uh, quite popular. People have been using it to validate, visualize their designs very quickly. But another advant advantage is generative design. We'll have a look at that in the next slide. Basically, it's all about uh, uh, designing and printing to validate your design to make sure it actually works instead of doing it on a simulated platform. Uh, we discussed spare parts uh, manufacturing. Uh, so we'll look at uh, the next slides, which gives you examples of uh, uh, 3D printed parts. So you can see this left side, Bugatti is being uh, printing some of their parts for their uh, special um, uh, uh, cars uh, using this uh, SLM technology uh, or selective laser bed uh, technology. So what is interesting is, as I explained to you in the product lifecycle slide, five to six years is what it used to take to develop a car. Which, is, which means if you're, as we speak, they're developing an automobile which is to come out in the year 2025 or 26. Uh, now that is changing uh, because people are demanding, technology is modifying or getting changed so quickly, people, they cannot afford to wait for five to six years. So people are expecting things to come out in two or three years time. So uh, 3D printing is the right route which is being adapted by uh, many manufacturers uh, in doing this. So you can see this on the right side here. There's a small engine block which uh, would you know, conventionally take about four to six weeks. This was printed by us in 48 hours. So just an example to tell you how time is everything and how it's being shrunken by a process like AIM. Next, uh, what you see is the generative design concept. So you can see this is basically a seat belt assembly by General Motors for one of their uh, next uh, gen cars, uh, which they, when they sat to design, they found multiple technology, multiple design concepts, which they finally dis uh, chose one of them after 3D printing and actually putting it to test. They assemble, I mean, they put the whole assembly, they printed the whole set, multiple of them, because as I said, if you remember, uh, variety is free in 3D printing, which means you could, you could print uh, 15 different varieties of uh, a part weighing around almost the same, or you could print one variety of parts uh, 15 uh, different times or 15 uh, numbers. They'll all be in uh, the same, uh, they'll all be uh, the same cost. So that way, uh, uh, people are putting actual design into use and then seeing validating it for themselves. So that's generative design. You'll see this. Interestingly, in the next slide, 20 individual pieces were put together. Sorry, eight individual pieces were put together uh, in this assembly to make it as a single piece, uh, which this way it was not only lighter, but also stronger. So that's the beauty of DFAM and also 3D printing.
So that was automotive. Uh, this is just a summary of the whole thing. So we have uh, 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 Renault, which is doing, uh, we'll see a small video uh, where 80, uh, where 200 different parts uh, of an engine uh, from a Euro 6 engine was printed, uh, where 841 parts were brought down uh, uh, to uh, fewer numbers. And uh, they use 3D printing here, not only to reduce uh, the number of parts, but also weight reduction. We'll just have a look at a short video which shows this whole process. You can see here, the original design was taken, and then a lot of DFAM techniques were done. Modified, lightweight, so you can see 42% 40, lighter. Each portion of the, so you can take a rocker assembly bearing cap, take it, make it lighter, and multiple of them got printed and put into this. So you have a rocker arm, 36% lighter. Multiple of them, again, put it back in. So uh, you take an um, uh, engine, uh, cylinder head, cylinder block, uh, you 80 parts were integrated, which means your runners, nut runners, a whole lot of other things which would have gotten integrated. All of them were put together here again. Parts got integrated, 45 parts got integrated into the cylinder head, which otherwise would have been individual pieces. So your 841 piece assembly got down to 200 parts lesser, so that way your BOM or your bill of material for this got reduced, and finally your whole assembly became faster. So that's basically the whole uh, show. Uh, similarly, Honda has done a lot of light weighting on their crankshafts, uh, which are made uh, lighter and better. Uh, so different automobile manufacturers are working on it. Even in India, Bajaj and many other automobile manufacturers have gotten into it. Now, this is another interesting case where you can see the lattice structures, as I explained. People have been trying out different parts. It may be cost, co it may be costly today, but they all know it's only a matter of time before which this technology is going to come in and then uh, take over the conventional way. So then people don't want to be starting uh, uh, to learn. So people want to invest time, effort, and money in learning the process, adapting, and finding out suitability for their application. Finally, when the technology really booms, they'll all be ready uh, with solutions and they'll adapt it very easily. So in this case, you can see. Um, in this case, you can see uh, uh, F1 uh, Alfa Romeo cars have about 143 metal parts which are being 3D printed and integrated into their racing cars. So like this, almost every industry which has niche applications are using that. We discussed the on-demand spare parts. We can skip this. So any remote location spares uh, uh, can be made available to 3D printing. Another interesting application is tooling. Tooling, when we say, is basically plastic injection molding or any other molding process. So conventionally, if you see, a molding process has about, uh, so you can see on the right side, uh, the whole molding process has about 65% time as cooling time because any plastic part that you actually injection mold uh, needs so much cooling because if you try ejecting it out faster, you'll end up warping the plastic. That way you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be spoiling the whole part. So that way they end up pulling it naturally. Now, next slide, what you see is uh, uh, this mold, which is there on the left side, uh, it, this is how the cooling is done, where they have a straight hole which is drilled called as a rectilinear hole, uh, which, through which cooling uh, water is passed to make it cool. Uh, whereas on the right side, what you see is uh, a, a conformal cooling channel, which is conformal cooling channel is where you have uh, a, a channel which takes the shape and size of the part itself. Uh, and that way it gives much better cooling and much uniform cooling and makes it much faster. So through 3D printing, we can achieve this. So all the uh, aspect that you see on the right side, which cannot be done conventionally, where you cannot drill holes of this shape, uh, can be done only through 3D printing. So uh, we have been doing a lot of molds also, uh, where 3D printed molds have uh, shown a lot of improvement, either in the form of warpages or removing of uh, these air traps, or even uh, getting better surface finish of uh, injection molded parts. So this is uh, basically one of the key advantages. You can see this warpage on the right side, where the part gets twisted or uh, uh, when it's removed, it doesn't give the actual form or shape that is required. So that is mainly because of non-uniform temperature distribution. Uh, next slide, you'll see uniform temperature distribution because of 3D printing. What you see on the left side is the red zone uh, is because of non-uniform temperature distribution, uh, where because using conventional cooling process, you can only achieve limited uh, cooling. Whereas on the right side, what you see is uh, conformal cooled channel, 
uh, where the cooling water goes all through the heat zones, which uh, when you have molten plastic injection uh, uh, happening, uh, and uh, because of uniform temperature distribution, you can see the thermal uh, uh, graph there, which shows uh, uniform temperature. That way, you can uh, re eject the part much faster. We have seen 30-40% improvement in cycle time using conformal cooling channel. Next. <laughs> So these are some more examples. You can see what used to take 50 seconds on the left side using conventional way got reduced to about 33 seconds, uh, thereby saving about 2 lakh rupees. Uh, next, you'll see something similar where customers saved about 40% in time, again, because of conformal cooling. And here, about 12 lakh rupees was saved uh, because, again, of uh, uniform temperature distribution. So that way, it's a big advantage. So going ahead, uh, even in the foundry application, uh, in the foundry application, what, what we've seen is patterns, as I explained initially, 3D printed patterns is one of the biggest uh, advantage where you can print these patterns and directly take it to your casting, which will make it uh, much more faster and much more uh, 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 advantageous in terms of uh, complexity. So the digital foundry is what they call it. So this is, an, again, another interesting subject. Next. So from an engineering perspective today, people are printing uh, different sorts of uh, parts for your uh, uh, your pumps, valves, and uh, injection, I mean, sorry, your uh, hydro hydraulic manifold blocks. Jewelry is being printed. Gears assemblies are being printed. That way, even in the engineering space, a lot of work is going on uh, in uh, the, using the 3D printed route. Next. So uh, what does the future have in store for us? So as I explained, mass customization, what used to be uh, uh, a customer, uh, uh, a customer would be able to interact uh, through a lot of uh, retail uh, source. This is being converted, uh, wherein customization ha is happening in terms of making sure every person gets what is very specifically required for them. If you see in the shoe space, I don't know if you've all heard, uh, already people like Nike and Adidas have uh, the sole of the shoe being 3D printed specific to a person's foot size and shape. So instead of choosing a 9, 10, or 11 size uh, without knowing what type of foot I have, uh, today you will be made to walk or run on a treadmill, which is uh, being watched by a camera, which can see your foot profile. It's called as a gait analysis, and that is being mapped into defining what sort of pressures are being applied on your foot from the bottom, and uh, a foot sole, insole, is being made very specific to your size and shape. So uh, this is being made in large volume. So like this, a lot of uh, uh, people have been working on uh, customization. So remember this word, it's called mass customization, where high volumes of parts will be made, but they'll be all each specific to a particular customer. So automobiles also may change to a specific taste of a customer going ahead. So there'll be a lot of distributed manufacturing also going ahead. You can see here, future, future supply chains are going to be something like this. Current traditional manufacturing follows uh, a whole lot of indirect route where you have manufacturers routing it through wholesalers and retail before it reaches a customer. Uh, whereas in additive manufacturing, uh, someone could approach the manufacturer directly and it could be made available. So basically, it's moving from a, a B2B space to a B2C space where a direct consumer can talk. Like I said, uh, you have service bureaus like ours where people can walk in and tell, look, I need a part which is of this particular size or shape to be made, and it can be made available in a few hours' time. So that way, a lot of the project works and many others are being made uh, through uh, 3D printing. Group. So uh, with the future, as uh, this topic is rightly uh, aimed at, uh, is going to be a big blend of Industry 4.0, where you have a lot of augmented reality, uh, you have virtual reality, you have Industry 4.0, you will have people sitting in America uh, sending a program uh, which has to be printed uh, in maybe uh, the in the smallest village of India or uh, even Africa uh, through, and they'll be controlling it through a digital uh, platform where everything will be uploaded on the cloud. All data will be uh, available, and then someone will manufacture it automatically, and then that comes out and gets dis and gets uh, uh, dispatched to maybe someone in Europe. So uh, the whole science is going to get changed. It's going to be a global village where people are going to have access uh, from different parts to uh, parts of the world, uh, sitting anywhere and trying to reach out and manufacture something and distribute it and uh, uh, make uh, make it happen. So uh, it's all going to change going ahead. Uh, it will not be the conventional way of uh, uh, doing uh, how we have been doing. So that's the beauty. And uh, one of the technologies which fits in well is additive manufacturing. So uh, uh, that's uh, us. So we basically, as I said, Amaze Solutions, we offer design engineering analysis solutions 
we print uh, different parts in metal we offer post processing we finish the parts and give it uh, uh, to suit the application or requirement uh, we do a lot of r and d in terms of developing parameters and materials um, and how we do it so going ahead we'll see a few quick examples of uh, what we've done uh, so materials, we can skip this. Um, uh, so uh, next, you'll see some of those uh, interesting case studies of what we have done. So this was basically for a Formula uh, SAE car uh, student uh, project where an electric car was being print was uh, being developed, and we printed these hubs for them. Uh, and you can see uh, a lot of lattice structures, light painting was done. We did DFEM for them, and then we did this for the rear wheel uh, hub. Uh, this was printed in aluminum and given to them. Next. Uh, this was again for an electric uh, motor. So this is basically a motor manufacturer who was making motors for uh, EVs. And in this case, uh, a lot of light weighting was done. You can see where those ribs are there. Uh, conventionally used to have a lot of solid material, but it was made suitable for 3D printing. And uh, conventionally, it was used to follow a die casting route. But with 3D printing, they were able to achieve it in a very short time. We also machined this part and gave it to them. Next, you see this is basically a convention. Uh, this is a conformal cooling uh, application where you can see there's a cut section of a mold or a die which was uh, uh, 3D printed. You can see the section inside has holes uh, and uh, channels which are in a very circular or windy way. You'll see another slide next which uh, shows this very interestingly. Um, you can see this here. This is basically a mold of uh, uh, a plastic injection molded part where uh, you can have these curvy linear holes where they go in a circular way and then cool the whole block uniformly without having to uh, actually uh, uh, go through a very uh, cumbersome process. This is uh, done through 3D printing and uh, a cut section is shown to you in the model there. This was a die casting application that we did for a TVS group company where you can see on the left side, um, you have these channels which go all the way up and then bring down, in this case, the customer's goal was better surface finish because of uniform temperature distribution, where you have a cooling liquid which goes all the way up and brings it down. Similarly, another application for a forging process where you have material, uh, basically a graphite lubricant which got sprayed through the small uh, vents which came out of this uh, forge punch, uh, which we were able to do. They're still under testing uh, and development. Once this gets done, we'll probably be able to do more on the forging space. Next. So these are some of the nozzles. I explained to you, variety is free. In 3D printing, the advantage, as I explained, you can see here more than eight different varieties of nozzles were printed, all at the same cost, uh, where this customer was using it for a spraying application, and they found that uh, this was uh, uh, quite helpful. And now they've gone from uh, prototyping to batch production to now mass production. So they'll be, uh, uh, they've been ordering on this nozzles, which will be made in high volumes, uh, but each of a different design and suiting a different purpose and application made very cost effectively through 3D printing. So we've been doing uh, aerospace parts also. You can see this here, an entire engine assembly uh, were put together by printing them in pieces uh, with very minimum machining requirement and then uh, finishing and then finally taking it up. So this way, this is basically a prototype that was done uh, for us. Like this, we've been working with different uh, uh, aerospace aviation industries, including uh, ISRO. So the next slide will show you we were a part of uh, the Chandrayaan 2 project, uh, wherein uh, uh, there were three parts. If you all remember, there's a lander, there's an orbiter, and there's a rover. The rover is basically an AGV which comes out of the lander uh, and uh, which was supposed to have gone all around the moon, making uh, uh, collecting information from the moon moon surface. Now you see this India logo on the left side. We printed this uh, in aluminum and gave it to them, which was pasted on the wheel of this uh, rover. Uh, you can see the simulation. It was supposed to have laid the printout of India on the moon surface. You can see that small India logo on the moon surface. So uh, the idea was to bring out India's signature on the moon surface when this happens. Unfortunately, the lander did land a little too hard because of which the rover could not come out. But nevertheless, there are many 3D printed parts made in India by ISRO sitting on the moon surface. So we are not very far behind uh, the other developed countries in adapting the newer technologies. So that's uh, what we have done. So you can see we did this in eight hours. Imagine printing India's signature to be taken on the moon in less than eight hours time. So that's what uh, technology has brought us to. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. If there's any questions, please uh, do ask. You can email us. Our email ID is there. Our numbers are there. Our website is there. Most welcome to look us up. Uh, I, I again thank you all for this opportunity uh, to uh, address uh, the gathering on this uh, interesting and exciting subject of additive manufacturing. Thank you.
ভালো আছে স্যার হ্যালো ভালো আছে স্যার So, uh, sir, if you have any questions, you can ask, sir. Yeah. yeah. Any questions at all? <laughs> Vinod. Yes, sir. Audible. I am audible. Yeah, yeah, sir. sir uh, audience uh, uh, participants if you have any questions you can uh, ask the questions you can unmute yourself and you can ask any questions if you have any questions related to the topic uh, hello sir yeah yeah sir Yeah, myself Ravi Kumar from uh, Venkateshwar Polytechnic, Banaras, Bangalore, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, my question is uh, uh, in the subtractive uh, subtractive machining process, uh, manufacturing yeah. process, uh, we will get lots of uh, lots of wastage, no? Yeah. Uh, those wastage can be utilized for uh, utilized and make a new component by using adaptive uh, manufacturing process. Is it possible, sir? Now, uh, I my answer will be yes and no. now it depends on what is your application uh, so we can see there are different ways of additive manufacturing so if you are looking at yeah. putting material together to form a part just for visualization without any industrial or functional hmm. use then maybe you can do that but the problem is when you have a used material it has a lot of uh, 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 unwanted undesired particles which get mixed with it uh, and when you are ta talking about this process of additive manufacturing you are touching a huge amount of metallurgy in it now uh, the last thing that you'd want is any adulterant entering into your part which is supposed to be homogeneous so uh, uh, unless it goes through a thorough process of cleaning and uh, uh, processing it may not be useful uh, but people are so basically we are only uh, processing powder now how the powder get manufactured Uh, could be through processes such as uh, it, it basically the main process is gas atomization now for a gas atomization to work you could have uh, uh, it's basically starts off with an ingot of material say for example an aluminum ingot or a, a stainless steel ingot which is fed in as an input material uh, to make this uh, powder now an ingot could use some of this used uh, scrap which comes out of subtractive manufacturing which goes through a lot of processing and then made uh, re melted and brought out as an ingot so directly we may not be able to make uh, powders out of the scrap of uh, subtractive manufacturing but a lot of uh, the waste can i'm sure it is happening today because uh, there's only limited amount of material available globally so uh, especially materials such as titanium which is extremely expensive you're better off melting them recycling them and then bringing them out as powder but uh, it's it's a subject which goes through multiple cycles there's no ready uh, machine which can take in scrap and then bring it out as a powder and be used for 3d printing okay sir understood sir thank you sir thank you yeah thank you thank you hello sir hello yeah hello good morning sir good morning uh, my name is subramani from uh, ips part okay uh, my question is that What is the accuracy? Dimensional accuracy we can achieve compared to the our conventional process, or like a CNC machines, we get a, a very unique dimension. Is it yeah, possible right. to get uh, in uh, 3D printing in uh, overall product dimensional accuracy? How can we can cope up to that is 3D printing? Yeah. So basically, right now, what is being done in large volumes? Uh, which is uh, the kind of area that we are in where a lot of printing is happening the powder bed uh, uh, fusion technology uh, the accuracies that are there are uh, uh, around the 0.1 plus or minus 0.1 mm to plus or minus 0.2 mm so that's where we are at this point in time but uh, it depends on the uh, uh, laser beam spot size Uh, so uh, the spot size that we are working on is around 70 to 80 microns which is why we are getting about 100 microns of accuracy 100 to 150 microns but for some of the finer applications people have even gone down to about uh, 10 microns uh, laser uh, beam spot size when they use that size of laser beam spot that have to go for finer powder uh, powder uh, uh, 
uh, particle sizes also for very fine, very specific applications. Uh, there have been successes where people have gone to uh, very, very tight tolerances of ma uh, manufacturing. But what we normally tell is uh, 3D printing cannot replace machining or manufacturing, machining the conventional processes completely. It will still have to be subjected to aspects such as a finish machining because just that skin cut to finish to get that final tolerance or accuracy may still have to be done based on, I mean, using the conventional way. So uh, otherwise, uh, 3D printing can uh, uh, take care of your casting, your roughing, your semi-finishing, but the final finishing may still have to be done the conventional way. Oh, okay, sir. What about the flexibility in uh, materials, sir? Yeah, so right now there are about eight or ten very prominent materials which are there available in uh, uh, in the open market. But a lot of research is happening. And like I said, any material that you can actually weld, if it's a weldable material, it can be 3D printed. So it's only a matter of time. Once applications okay. start coming up more and more, uh, the manufacturers will start investing and when the volumes increase, the cost will come down and the recipe also will get generated. So a lot of this is happening. Uh, see, it's not a very straightforward thing to uh, 3D print because uh, you need to make sure you get the right set of parameters to uh, touch the metallurgical aspects of it and uh, make sure you get the right shape and uh, without any deformations or defects or uh, uh, blowholes or any other aspect that comes on a casting process. Uh, which is uh, what we have to safeguard. So uh, it, it is happening as we speak. A lot of new materials are being introduced, uh, but what is prominently available are about eight or ten different materials. Okay, okay. So, so okay, sir. And also, so, sir, another thing. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, the materials before pre-processing, pre-processing of the three D printing, yeah. so that the material should be in the powder form. Yeah, that's right. Form or, uh, powder form. So powder again, form. Yeah. Further, there's a powder bed technology. If you have a wire fed technology, then power material is available in the wire form also. Oh, okay, okay. When you convert to powder form, again, that is also a cost. Uh, it uh, relates to the cost of that material overall manufacturing yeah. process. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, that is also a, a drawback. So immediately we cannot affect uh, to the raw material. Cost factor if you take. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That is. How can work yeah. in that uh, process? So yeah. So basically, it is an expensive process today. Uh, but okay. where people see value in it, they are going so, yeah, to. So yeah. So basically, uh, and with time, we have uh, the cost of manufacturing, also cost of powders coming down, cost of uh, machines coming down. The whole process is getting more productive. This way, if you see okay. what used to cost uh, 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 X. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, today it's already costing about 0.1x. So we've known of certain okay. parts which used to cost about 25, 30,000 to make. They're all sitting at about 2,000, 3,000 rupees today, even in metal. Okay. So I'm just giving you a, uh, uh, you know, a fictional number, but uh, the costs are coming down. So it's only a matter of time before which a lot of it will get even more uh, cost effective. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, one more question. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, is there any opportunity to do innovation in bringing out a scrap material uh, into a powder suitable for uh, additive manufacturing process? Sure, sure. Opportunities are endless. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people who did think early and uh, try out, uh, they are the ones who have been innovating uh, interesting things uh, globally. So uh, I would definitely say it's uh, it's all about trying and uh, experimenting. You can uh, get in touch with some of the powder manufacturers in India and see if they, you can collaborate because see, the whole process of manufacturing powders is a very expensive process, which means the whole equipment that is required to uh, invest in making the powders uh, would uh, run anywhere between 30, 40, 50 crores. And the yield is less than 25%, which means you put one ton of uh, stainless steel, you end up getting only 25% of powder, which is suitable for metal printing. Uh, unless you have a customer base uh, for the other portion of the material, uh, then you're wasting a lot of uh, time. So that way it ends up becoming more expensive. So uh, uh, it's it's a catch-22, but uh, I wouldn't discourage you. You're welcome to get in touch with uh, different uh, powder manufacturers who can uh, uh, probably share their views, and then you can see how you can uh, contribute in terms of either research or maybe taking up a practical case. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> all right, great. Thank you all. Thank you again. Thank you for this opportunity.
you are welcome you, to visitors uh, uh, dr kapilan you are welcome to bring a team uh, to uh, uh, from the institute to our uh, college i mean to our uh, to our uh, uh, facility will be happy to show you in uh, physical form of course things are a little uh, challenging right now in terms of visits but uh, once the uh, covid situation settles down and we are a little more uh, movable agile then i think i welcome you all uh, to visit us uh, and have a look at what we are doing and how we are doing and uh, uh, give you a better idea of uh, uh, the whole technology thank you sir sir it was really an excellent presentation we thank you for sharing your knowledge on latest technology your presence thank has you. uh, immensely enhanced its importance sir we are extremely thank grateful you. to you thank you very much thank sir. you so much i'm very glad i'm very glad have a wonderful thank rest you. of the program and i wish uh, all of you the very best and success thank you again thank you very much sir thank you uh, dear participants um, we will share the google form uh, in where uh, the feedback and the quiz has to be given and uh, we request you to submit the google form once you get that uh, once we sh after we share the google form thank you thank you one and all question kela pay edidre thank you sir we shall end now and uh, we request sir. you to join the session tomorrow thank you sir thank you. Thank you.